Thank you so much, Amy. Well, welcome to the engineering lab in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. This is where the Vortex and Mag product engineering lab is based. And we're going to be showing you a demo today, as Amy said, of the multivariable flow meter. The 8800 provides some new capabilities for pressure and temperature compensation. Before we get started, though, I'd like to ask a question. Steam is always a tricky thing to measure. And so I'm interested today in everybody that's watching, if we have uh, people that are using steam and what types of steam we're using. So you'll see the polling question pop up that says, what kind of steam are you using? It will be either superheated, saturated, or both. Thank you so much for that input. We're gonna start today with this lab setup that you see here on the table in front of me. What, what we're actually uh, doing here is steam uh, can be a really tricky thing to measure. From superheated to saturated, different uh, ambient conditions, be it the uh, temperature outside can get cold on a day like today in Minnesota, it might be below zero, and it changes your readings. In the cases of uh, where your pressure changes in your line, uh, can be a challenge. Sometimes it can be uh, due to those uh, impulse lines freezing or being able to just see the other uh, conditions around you change. And really, what you need to measure is what's going through that pipe, the steam that you're actually uh, getting from point A to point B. And pressure compensation and temperature compensation really give you new insights there. Instead of taking the volumetric flow readings, this actually gives you a mass compensated flow reading. And by taking that pressure and temperature input, you're able to uh, compensate for those changes around you. So today what you're actually looking at is actually the 8800 uh, vortex flow meter. And it's actually uh, connected directly to the 3051S Rosemont pressure transmitter, as well as the actual temperature probe, which I'm holding in my hand to simulate today. Now, we're in a lab environment, so we're simulating steam. So I've actually shifted my temperature reading a little bit to, in order to do this demo so that we don't have to have live steam here. So today what I'm uh, simulating is normal steam's about room temperature, and then we're gonna cool it down with this ice bath here, which will actually take and drop the temperature of the probe a little bit, simulating a, a temperature loss in your pipe. And we'll see how those results change. The pressure compensation, similarly here, I have a, a hand pump that we're gonna actually be able to uh, take and let out. I have about 50 pounds of pressure in it, and we'll let a little bit of that air out to be able to simulate what happens when your line pressure drops. So let me show you a couple of the cool things that you can do here. First and foremost, the 8800 is communicating to the pressure device through the heart digital communications. That is uh, a way to actually get the pressure update. So as pressure updates come into the 8800, and we can then do the flow compensation with that, taking that pressure information in. In addition, we need to take that temperature input. That temperature probe comes into the bottom of the 8800 flow meter. The flow meter then can take the, both the pressure information now and the temperature and run it through the flow calculation. One more thing to look at uh, for the connectivity here. Today we're actually simulating the power for the, pre the Vortex device, which is also providing pressure, the pressure device with power as well. To make this easier, when we actually go and install this in the field, we use the heart uh, communications bridge. And what that does is it actually allows a simple way to wire up and share that heart communications between the two uh, transmitters. So the pressure transmitter and the vortex transmitter can each have their four to 20 milliamp signals separated. And today we're just uh, sharing the power, but the heart bridge simplifies this in the field for your wiring. Now let me show you uh, what we can do here for the uh, pressure readings. So. As you're uh, looking at the uh, uh, information here coming through uh, that's being logged on the PC, you can actually see that the volumetric uh, flow rate as well as the mass flow rate are uh, relatively stable here. However, in the real world, if I actually take and add a little bit of pressure to that pipe, we can actually see how those readings change. The volumetric, unfortunately, is not changing. The volumetric hasn't changed. In this case, we're simulating it with the uh, uh, simulator here, but you see that the volumetric hasn't changed. Now, if you think about it, we've actually put more pressure in that pipe, so there's actually more energy coming through. The steam that's in that pipe is actually flowing more because it's more compressed. So you really wanna know what that real energy reading is, and that's where the mass calculation comes in. And the 8800 is doing that co compensation for you, taking that pressure information in. When it changes, it then adjusts it. Let's do the same thing, but now moving over to the uh, temperature side. 
if we actually take, and we're sitting at about room temperature now, we can actually take and drop that temperature. Now remember, temperature takes a little bit of time to react, so we're actually going to see that that's going to actually slowly uh, decline over time. Again, same situation. That volumetric flow rate is not changing. But because the temperature has changed, we have a different amount of steam going through the pipe. So the really important part here is that the multivariable flow meter can actually take that information in and compensate how much steam is going through the pipe. And so you get an actual, actually a more accurate energy measurement of what's going into uh, the process unit that you're using. The neat thing is, by doing this in real time, changing conditions that are happening uh, around your facility can be automatically incorporated into your readings and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Much simplifying instead of trying to do these pressure and temperature compensation calculations in your control system. So one of the really key benefits here also is some of the additional things that you might and features that you might use with this capability. So in superheated steam applications, you are often looking for a certain amount of superheat. And the, uh, one of the diagnostics that we've added into this capability is the number of degrees of superheat. That's a great piece of information to know what your steam is actually doing in a little bit more detailed basis. So we can actually, the, calc the transmitter can calculate those steam differences and look at what are the different temperature changes or pressure changes and tell you how, much, how many degrees of superheat you have as well. A great piece that you can also track for your control system and know that if you have a process problem that you can address before it becomes a much larger issue. In the case of uh, saturated steam, really you only need either pressure or temperature compensation. The nice thing is with the 8800 multivariable uh, flow meter, you actually can choose which one you'd like. It can do temperature compensation where you don't need the pressure setup, or you can actually add the pressure setup and you don't even need the temperature measurement in that case. And we use the steam curves that are actually already built into the 8800. Those steam curves then can give you the, that steam information of where you sit on the saturated steam line. But a lot of users have actually found out that, that steam is actually a little different than what they originally thought. And so by adding the pressure and temperature compensation, they're actually uh, able to get a much more holistic picture. So in, in summary, I just wanted to uh, wrap up here and say uh, thank you for uh, visiting, but one of the uh, key things that uh, we were able to show today was around the 8800 and how it compensates for you, eliminating some of those biggest challenges of plugged impulse lines or frozen impulse lines, being able to do the steam flow measurement for you, and being able to get that mass measurement and the volumetric flow measurement, as well as pressure and temperature data back into the uh, control system. And now we're going to take your questions. Amy, what do we got? Well, we got a lot of questions. I'd like to thank everybody for their input. Um, you're good students. You're following direction. And Wally, I uh, took a moment to organize them a little bit uh, so that we had a nice flow here because there's, there's great content. So great. the first one that we have is how does pressure transmitter communicate with the vortex transmitter? Oh, that's a great question, Amy. So. We're actually, as we communicate with the Vortex device, that pressure device is actually uh, doing what's called a uh, heart burst mode. And it's actually bursting the information from the pressure transmitter okay. and digitally capturing that and going into the Vortex device. In essence, it's what's called catch variable. So the digital communications is actually acting uh, as almost like a, uh, a baseball glove, being able to catch the information on the bus as it's able to communicate from one device to the other. So the Vortex device is just capturing that information and using that for the calculations. Okay, so with that then, someone said something related to this um, is, you know, how do you wire, connect these devices together? Oh, Amy, that's a great question. Let me uh, show you this heart bridge to really make this easier for you. The heart bridge itself actually has two places where you can connect two different devices. Basically, the input from one device to the other, uh, and it will go in the one and out in the other to the field. The other one is the connection for that pressure device, Amy, and we'll actually take and pull that information in and then take in, uh, those two wires out to the field. The heart bridge itself, when you enable it, will actually share that communications between the vortex device and the pressure device. So the heart communications bridge really makes this a lot easier to wire up for you. Okay. Thank you, Wally. I have another one here. 
um, can you explain more about what the Heart Communication Bridge does? Sure, absolutely, Amy. That's a great question as well. The Heart Bridge internally, what it really does is it's actually sharing that communications, that message from one heart loop to the other. So it's actually sharing the information, in this case, from the pressure device to the vortex device. It, in essence, shares that communications without interfering in the control signals. So it's a really key part to be able to make that communications happen. The other important part to know is if you don't have a communications bridge, you still can actually take and connect the devices from one to the other. So for example, in the case where maybe you want to just use the pulse outputs for the uh, 8800, the analog output, that four to 20 communications, is not needed for you. So we just use that as the power supply. That can then bridge over to the pressure device, and the pulse output would just be run back to the control system just like you normally would. So a nice easy way to connect it if you don't need the, uh, that digital communications into the control system. That pulse input would give you the information that you need for totalized values. Okay, excellent. Let's see, what else do we have here? Okay, how often does the 8800 MV received the pressure value from the heart pressure transmitter? Sure, that's a great question, Amy, and a common one that we get a lot. So when we actually take and look at the communications that's going from the heart device to the vortex device, that happens about every one to three seconds that we're getting the pressure updates. It depends a little bit about what other heart communications are going on. For example, in my case, I actually was logging that with a computer that was also talking heart. So the traffic is a little bit busier there, just like a roadway. But when you have just those two devices talking to each other, you see it a little bit faster. So between one and three seconds, you'll get an update from your pressure device. Okay, excellent. Great questions, everyone. Keep them coming. Uh, let's look at, ooh, this one's good. What happens if the connection is lost between the heart pressure monitor and the 8800 MV? Oh, another great question. Thank you for that one. Um, so the 8800 actually does keep track of when the updates come in. So when you're actually taking and getting that information, it makes sure that there's a timer between each of the messages so that if you actually end up losing that communications, you'll have a timeout window, just like a control system would do. So you can actually configure that setting in the 8800 itself as to how long before you have it go into an alarm. So knowing that you have some options there of how you want to manage the alarm uh, in that case where you lose communications. Great. Well, we've got time for one more, and I think uh, this one is a good way to conclude here. How fast can the 8800 MV calculate compensated mass flow measurement? Yeah, another great question. So the 8800, even though it's getting the updates every one to three seconds from that pressure device, we're actually calculating it uh, faster than five times a second. We're going at about 150 milliseconds it's uh, taking to process the time. So about every 150 milliseconds or so, we're actually updating the device and then updating the analog output uh, respectively with that. Um, the digital communications, if you're getting the information via heart, it's a lot slower. That digital communications bus tends to be a little bit slower because heart is just a slow protocol. So we're able to actually extract that information on the analog signal much uh, faster, as well as the pulse signal. Um, so either one of those updates are uh, done about every 150 milliseconds. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I think I'd like to, to add this one, if that's okay. Sure. Um, we have someone looking at, um, can you share where you should where the pressure transmitter should be mounted, excuse me, um, in relative position to the vortex flow meter. Oh, that's a great question, Amy. Yeah, let me follow up on that one because I really like that question. If you're looking at the vortex device and it's flowing, downstream is a great place to mount that pressure device so it's not interfering with the shutter bar. Remember, vortex technology is using a uh, shutter bar inside the pipe and the flow rate creates uh, vortices as it comes around that shutter bar. So in this case, if you're upstream and creating disturbances, it can have some detrimental effects to your measurements. So you don't want to do that. 
But if you go downstream, about six pipe diameters for the pressure input and be able to get that information from there, that's a, that's a good installation. It won't interfere with the measurements. So look for about uh, six uh, pipe diameters downstream. So if you have a one inch pipe, about six inches downstream, usually it's relatively close to the device. Uh, you can find a pressure port to put in the pressure device. So great question, Amy. Thanks for uh, ad adding that one. That's a good one. Oh yeah, I thought so too. And thank you for your time. Great information. And thank all of you for your questions.